thank you for all that has transpired over our time together here at PELC 2017. We are thankful for what you will do in this particular service today. In Jesus' name, amen. We are happy to have as our presenter for this session, uh, Pastor Michael Polite, who serves as the associate chaplain of Andrews University. He also serves as the lead pastor of the New Life Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is on the campus of Andrews University. He's going to come and share with us today, mobilizing millennial activists. I'm going to ask if you would be kind and put your hand together. Let's receive our presenter today, uh, Pastor Michael Polite, Associate Chaplain and Lead Pastor, New Life. Thank you, Pastor Griffin. Um, I want to welcome everyone to Mobilizing Millennial Activists. Listen, this is a topic matter that I am personally overly passionate about. So please forgive my passion if it starts spilling out all over this sanctuary. I believe that the gospel version that was given to us by slave masters has eroded our ability to be active in our communities. And we are going to be talking more about that because it's central to us building spaces where millennial activists feel welcomed. Uh, this session is really a response to the polarized climate within our country at this time. And I believe it is becoming more and more evident that for a local church, um, specifically in a urban context, for that church to be successful in attracting professionals, young adult professionals to their church, they will have to speak to the pathos of activism. It is no longer acceptable for a local church to try to play the middle ground of diplomacy. Uh, the current generation is not interested in that anymore. What they want to know is, where do you stand? Are you here to exploit our community? Or, in fact, are you here to support and build up our community? And so with that being said, I do want to introduce myself once again. My name is Michael Polite, and I have the privilege of serving at Andrews University in the Office of Campus Ministries, as well as leading one of the three campus churches there uh, on, uh, at Andrews. One that I am over is New Life Fellowship, and I have the privilege of presenting uh, with one of our directors there in the Office of Campus Ministries. This is Pastor Garrison Hayes. He is currently leading us out of the Campus Ministries office in um, relating and ministering to graduate students. He is a student chaplain of graduate initiatives in Campus Ministries, as well as the director of New Life's integrity ministry. So it's just an honor to have him here to present with me. He was very much involved in the case study that we will impact here this morning. And his willingness to participate is just major. It's major for this presentation. And I think it will add texture and a more holistic perspective of what we're talking about when it comes to activism. So we're going to kick this thing off by introducing you to one of my favorite activists, one of my favorite Seventh-day Adventist activists. Uh, her name is Ev. Can someone say hi, Ev? Man, Ev is one of the coolest people you will ever meet in the entire world. If you were to go to Ev and say, yo, what's up, Ev? She would probably respond, it's lit. That's, that's how she responds every single day. I mean, she is on a path and a mission to let her light shine. Uh, but Ev would probably cause many of your churches a bit of consternation. For example, look at her t-shirt, would you? End Eurocentric Adventism. Now, Ev recently la launched a clothing line, and her clothing line has one mission, and it's very clear and very concise. Her clothing line exists to disturb colonized minds. Now, Ev is only an undergrad student. 
And yet she is functioning at this very high level of understanding when it comes to the systemic marginalization of black people around the world. She is very much there. She is there when it comes to advocating for the systemic marginalization of brown people all over the world. And one thing she says in a poem that she just released on campus at our recent poetry slam night, it was, it was amazing. She said, we must, End Eurocentric Adventism. Ev is a millennial activist. And the question is, could Ev find safe haven and opportunity at your local church? Could she? I want to stand because this is one of her most recent releases in her clothing line, In the Use of White Jesus. Now, what I need you to kind of embrace here this morning is that this shirt was inspired by collaboration between Ev and my church. We saw what Ev was doing and we said, man, we wanna be a part of this. Is there a way that we can help design one of your shirts? She said, oh, I would love that. Ev is an active member of our board at New Life an active member of our board who also has this passion for advocacy and systemic changes that need to be made, according to Ev. And so we came to the table with Ev and we said, listen, how can we help you? She said, I'd love some ideas on some shirts. Bet, let's partner with one another. And this is what came out of our collaboration in the use of white Jesus. Now that is going to catch many Adventists off guard. Guarantee. Why? Because we have not accepted the premise that we are progenitors of a colonized gospel. See, we go back to Constantine only to tie him into the beastly power of Revelation 13. But do you recognize that Constantine was very much interested in the gospel that you preach? Because Constantine saw an opportunity. I am going to weaponize the gospel of Jesus Christ to make sure that it is not a gospel of empowerment, but it becomes a gospel of pacification. And so you think that your aversion to protesting is coming out of some type of Christ-like sensibility. I would suggest, no, in fact, Constantine has just done his job. The majority of Adventist believers are colonized minds. They do not recognize that the gospel they preach is actually putting more shackles on members than tearing the chains off their wrists and their ankles. Anytime the gospel seeks to put someone in their place, shut someone up, make you sit down, make you fall in line, that is a colonized gospel. Constantine understood that there's strength in unity, but also unity through faith. So how can I use this gospel to make sure that the people we conquer never come against us, never rebel, there's no revolution? How can we mechanize them to teach their children to submit to our authority. I know I'll use the icon, Jesus. The colonized gospel is not just simply a gospel of advocacy. Let us define terms here. Advocacy is defined as public support or official recommendation given on behalf of a cause or policy. Yeah, Adventists, we believe in that. We believe in that. We'll give some public support. We'll give shout outs. We'll, we'll tweet about it. We'll post about it. We might even go to the papers to tell them that we support. But here's the thing I believe the gospel's trying to move us towards, and that is act Activism, the policy or action of using vigorous campaigning to bring about political or social changes. All right, let me make this a little bit more palatable with a real-time Adventist example. We see both of these terms played out perfectly at constituency meetings. Yeah, there are certain people who show up simply to advocate. Right? They just want to step to the mic and give public support or a recommendation based on what they think is best. But how many of us know that there are some people behind closed doors 
weeks before constituency session who are vigorously campaigning to bring about political changes. So as Adventists, we are activists when it comes to populating our conference offices, union offices, division offices, and GC offices. We believe in activism then, but as soon as you call me to the table to become an activist on behalf of the community where my church sits, you won't hear me say a word, because that's not Christ-like. Christ was an agitating, subversive element in any environment we find him in. And our churches need to embrace once again the ministry of activism. There's nothing wrong with protests and uprisings. The only way you know if it's right or wrong is who lifted up this uprising. Is it an uprising started by the spirit of God or is it an uprising started by the spirit of Satan? And we know how to differentiate between the two because one seeks to gain things for itself out of greed. The other seeks to gain things on behalf of others via self-sacrifice. So protest is essential to the gospel message being carried into the whole entire world. Yet the missionaries... The missionaries of the dark ages, what were they commissioned to do? Not to take the everlasting gospel into all the world, but to take a colonized gospel to pacify the nations. And it is time for our churches to take back that territory by simply doing two things. Most churches right now are positioned to reject activism and quell it. But we want to invite you over the next few minutes to consider becoming a local church or a spiritual guide that directs activism and swells it. Is your church a space where activism is being rejected and quelled or directed and swelled? And so with that being said, we want to take you to a very volatile time on the campus of Andrews University during the academic year of 2016 and 2017. So it's, we're preparing for Black History Month and our university has a Black History Month committee where students, uh, faculty, administrators, staff members, uh, black ones come together to determine what will happen at the Black History Month events, what our calendar will look like for that month. And as we are sitting around the table trying to decide what exactly our theme will be for that month, we're thinking about the rising tensions that are happening in our country at that time. This is around November of 2016, so we know that Donald J. Trump was just elected as president. And in an international community like Andrews, we are considering um, the fact that the, his policies, his rhetoric will be destructive, divisive, and oppressive to our international community. So we are already kind of forecasting that this will be an issue. As black students, we're thinking about the fact that Donald Trump's election will undoubtedly lead to the events that we see in Charlottesville just a little while later. So as we're thinking about a theme, the thing that comes to mind, what we finally decide on and what our university actually approves is for us to have a theme of prayer, politics, and protest. So this is our Black History Month theme. And it's informed seriously by Colin Kaepernick's NFL protest, him taking a knee. So we're thinking about taking a knee, uh, prayer, politics, and protest. So Black History Month finally rolls around and our guest speaker comes through and this dude is amazing. Dr. Jamie Kalisar is bringing a word. I mean, he comes on Thursday and 30 seconds into his presentation, he is already calling out the systems of oppression that are existent in our world, in our institution, in Adventism, in the American political system. Uh, he calls him, as you guys know, Agent Orange, right? So he's talking about Donald Trump in this really direct way. It was one of the first times I had ever heard someone be so direct about the things that were going on in politics from the pulpit. 
It was, it was amazing. So in this, in this sermon series, as he's doing on Thursday, Friday, and, and on Sabbath, he's inviting students to be advocates, to take up the cause of social justice, to do what the Bible says in uh, loving your neighbor as yourself. But I think the beautiful thing that Jamie does as he is preaching is that he's not only calling out the systems of oppression, that would be one thing. If he just gotten up there and called out all all of the systems of oppression that we were facing in his sermons, that would be one thing. But in the process, he is oft also uplifting the black community unapologetically. He's doing this thing where, I mean, in the, in the text it says to um, love your neighbor as yourself, and what's assumed there is that you love yourself. I think a major barrier to engaging students and activists to actually go out and be catalysts for change is, first of all, they don't love themselves. There are plenty of black people who just do not love themselves. So what Jamie is doing is that he is not only just calling out those systems of oppression, but he's also uplifting us, telling us that we are beautiful, uh, that our black skin is beautiful, our our noses are beautiful and our big lips are beautiful. And it, was, it was just absolutely incredible this, to see students um, just cheering, like the choir was behind him, literally on their feet throughout the entire sermon, just cheering, so thankful to be affirmed in that way. It was moving, it was moving. But his message um, was actually changed, it was reframed by Republican students on campus. A minority of Republican students on campus heard his message and reframed it as a democratic speech, when in reality he was just calling out systems of oppression. Now I think it's interesting that Republicans uh, on campus felt personally attacked when he was calling out these systems of oppression and I think that's often because republicanism and conservatism finds itself aligning with the white supremacy ideals of oppression. So when he is calling out these systems of oppression, they take it personally as Republicans, even though he never once used rhetoric that was partisan in any way. But they take it that way. So they go back and they tell their parents and their family members and the university administration is starting to receive pressure from parents um, to actually apologize for the things that Jamie was saying. If you understood how affirmed the community felt, if you understood how much that impacted the black community on campus in a positive way, you'll understand exactly why that would be uh, something that, that, that will really rub us the wrong way for them to apologize. And one week later, Jamie starts preaching on Thursday, Dr. Kalasar. One week later, the very following Thursday, uh, our university administration at Andrews University, the provost, stands up at convocation at the chapel on that very next Thursday, and he apologizes for the things that Dr. Kalasar said, saying that they were inappropriate. This is undermining all of the affirmation that we had just received as students. The fact that we're listening to things that we know are fact. We know that what Donald Trump is saying and on his podium is. Amen. We know that what he's saying on his platform is, is, is to undermine people of color, immigrants. So then the university apologizes for that exactly one week later. So what we see here is that the people who felt empowered were rejected. The message was quelled. So naturally, the next step is that we will feel marginalized. So when people are rejected, when the message is quelled, the natural outcome of that is marginalization as opposed to if it had been directed and swelled, if, if they had embraced the message that Dr. Kalasar brought to Andrews University, people would have felt discipled. They would have felt valued. Instead, it is rejected, quelled, the stories of students are dismissed, and marginalization happens. So now, I start getting a flood of text messages after this assembly. And 
These messages are coming into my office from wounded students. And these wounded students have a just cause. Their cause is just because, as Garrison so eloquently put it, they were being affirmed. Their experience was being affirmed. Their suffrage was being affirmed. And then they had to sit there and hear the institution diminish that affirmation and even apologize, framing it as inappropriate. Now, this is not new to the black experience in America. It is something that many of us have experienced on our jobs, in our own institutions of higher learning, even back down to elementary classrooms, where we find people apologizing for our blackness, apologizing for the voices that stood up for us, etc. So I'm getting these text messages in, and here's where I want to engage you. I want you to put yourself in my shoes your students, your young adult professionals and your community now start speaking to you about the individual who was wrongfully shot, an unarmed individual shot in your community, or who was wrongfully the recipient of police brutality, or who has been wrongfully accused of a crime and not truly given their just due in the court of law. What are you going to do when your young adult professionals start knocking on your door because they see you as a trustworthy individual in the community and they say, if anyone can help us, it's you. What are you going to do? I'm gonna suggest that at that point, you need to begin shepherding your activist. Shepherding your activist. And here's what I mean by that. You need to start doing five things for the activists who start knocking on your door in your community. You need to unify their intent. You need to unify their cause, unify their spirit, unify their method, and unify their etiquette. See, when these students are, are sending me their text messages, I can tell that they're each upset about different aspects of the morning. Not all of them have the same identical grievance, which means that they are not yet on one accord about what they want to do. They have emotion right now that they desire to emote, but they don't know how to direct it and swell that emotion. So these five steps will help you. So I'll take you through how I did them. First, the student leaders who text me, I asked that they would all take time out of their busy schedules to come to my office so we could meet. They all accepted. We sat down and I started hearing the grievance and what I told them was, I am unwilling to lead a movement that is coming against an administration for doing what is within the realm of their job description. They have not overstepped their boundaries by trying to censor the type of rhetoric that happens on their campus. That's actually the job of a university administrator to look out for the language that's being used and to make sure that language aligns with the values expressed by the university. This administration felt at the time like Jamie Kalasar's values, his rhetoric, did not align with the school's rhetoric. So we're on the low ground if we try to come against them on that. I said, but what I'm really hearing from you students is something deeper than that. That's something that transcends this moment in our school year. What I hear from you is, they responded to these Republican students, predominantly white, pred uh, predominantly white Republican students and their families. They responded to those students within one week. But the grievances of black students and families have yet to be responded to in such a public and concise way in Andrews University history. I said, there's the disparity. No, they have every right to say, I don't like this speaker on my campus. But what they don't have the right to do is to treat a specific demographic with a little more care and interest than they treat you. There's our moral high ground, which gets us to unifying the cause. Our cause is not fighting for a speaker we really like, a speaker who made us shout, a speaker who made us cheer, a speaker who was talking our language. Our cause is to, is to advocate and activate a movement on behalf of every black alum who had ever attended Andrews University campus. That is our cause. 
That is what you call moral high ground. Once we had a unified cause, we had to unify our spirits. And we began talking about how the spirit of Jesus Christ is one of activism. Spirit of the Lord is upon me. You know the rest of the text. He is going to be an activist within Judea and Galilee. This man is going to start shaking stuff up. He's going to come against institutions. He's going to advocate for those who've been left behind or forgotten, left out, whatever word you want to use. He has come for those people. Therefore, the Holy Spirit that was upon him is the same spirit that wants to rest upon us. We unified our spirit, then we unified our methodology. And we started looking at different types of protests. We, we looked at the protests of a sit-in. We considered calling those who agree to barricade themselves at the entrance of the cafeteria and to commit to not leaving until the demands of the movement were met to keep people from access to the calf. We thought about that. We said, hmm. I think we're going to lose more people than gain more people when people start getting hungry. I mean, that's just, that's just how it is. We don't think that our, our support base is that strong to carry that level of protest. We went through different options. We went through marches around campus, et cetera. But finally we said, no, if we're really advocating on behalf of students past and students present, what is a medium that allows us equal access to both demographics at the same time? Social media. And so we found our method, and then we had to unify our etiquette. Etiquette such as we will not make any comments to justify or defend our actions on social media. Why? Because social media does not allow you to appropriately provide context. And anything you say will and can be used against you in the court of law. So once we launch our cause, we will not interact on social media. If individuals accost us on this campus, we will remain quiet. And we will never speak to anyone about our cause unless there is more than one of us there to advocate for the other. We had a complete etiquette laid out, much of which was borrowed from the SNCC movement of the 1950s. Training students of higher education to have proper etiquette as they protest. And so we took a page out of the book of our ancestors and we found ourselves appropriately positioned to launch a campaign that we felt would reverberate across the denomination. So the thing that we came up with was this, it is time AU. We were sitting around in our room thinking, in, in, in an office, thinking about what exactly we will call this and this is what we came up with. It is time AU. And it really represented exactly what we've been talking about. This one week time frame that it took for them to respond to the concerns of others while generations have passed and there has been no response to the concerns of black students. It is time, AU. So we get together and we come up with a script for this, uh, for this video. We script out everything, we make sure that it's clear, we make sure that the language of everything that we're trying to communicate is exactly what we're wanting to receive. We make our demands, our asks, we make those things very, very clear in the video. And from a production standpoint, from the, for those who are interested, it was a single camera, we got a ring light. Um, the art of it was extremely important to me because I think that it communicated a certain thing to our audience. Uh, having the light as a ring light put these uh, light circles in the eyes, which makes the gaze a lot more piercing. Uh, so, so as you will see the video in just a little bit, it, it has a very piercing look to it, and that was an intentional, intentional art decision um, so that our, our message really came across well. Um, the editing process was that we, after we shot the video, where everyone was saying their part of the script, saying it is time, um, after we shot that, we gave it to our editor, whose name is Joy. Uh, Joy edited the video. We considered whether or not to do it in black and white um, for dramatic effect or to have it in color. You'll see that we ultimately decided to do it in color because it, we felt that the hues of people's skin, all of the different shades of 
of black uh, was beautiful and, and really indicative of all the people who this affects. Um, going into it, we all had different concerns and questions. How will we launch this? What, what will we do? What, where will we put it? Uh, we ultimately decided that we wanted to put it on a medium that would get the most reach possible. Okay, so we're thinking about doing this through social media. So if we put it on YouTube and, and, and people can share it, where will people share it the most? Well, the likelihood is that people would share it the most on Facebook, right? So if we put it on YouTube, then they could copy the link and put it on Facebook and send it out. But YouTube's algorithms, or Facebook, excuse me, Facebook's algorithms don't prioritize YouTube videos. So we decided we would upload it directly to Facebook on someone's personal Facebook page, and that was my personal Facebook page. We'd upload it to mine, make sure that it's shareable to everyone in all of our networks, just a public video so that it could be shared and sent out. We knew that the comment section would be very important, allowing people to have that dialogue and that conversation as it continues on. So this is all the, these are all the things that are going into the production of our video. As we finish producing it and we're ready to, to, to put it out there, the thing that I believe really helped us to stay engaged, just to stay resolute on what we were trying to accomplish was the fact that we knew we were right. We knew that what we were asking for was reasonable. We knew that the Spirit had influenced us to take this step, and we knew that our message was important. And as Polite says, we knew that it wasn't just for us. It wasn't just for the students on our campus now, but the students, black students, minority students who have passed through Andrews uh, for decades. So at this time, I'll just invite you to turn your attention to the screen to see what it is that we produced. It is time. It is time. It is time for Andrews University to apologize for the systemic racism it has perpetuated on its campus. Since 1874, this institution has too often mirrored the bigotry of American society rather than reflecting the true values of Jesus Christ. Black students and their families have often submitted grievances expressing the racism and hate that they've experienced from past grievances such as forced segregation in the cafeteria to present grievances such as a lack of proper ethnic representation among faculty and administration. For decades, our friends and our family have asked for a response, but our university has remained silent. You would think that after 143 years, a faith-based university would feel compelled to follow the biblical counsel on reconciliation. You would think that it would have already said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And yet, Andrews, like the United States of America, has championed the story of Jesus, but hasn't followed the counsel of Jesus. So here we are. Asking once again for an apology that should have been given generations ago. Our administration has shown us that responding to grievances only takes one week. One week. One week. One week. You have one week. To release a formal statement of apology for the wrongful discrimination against black students of this institution. Not only apologizing for past discrimination, but acknowledging the presence of current discrimination. You have one week. One week to not only apologize, but to commit to making the measurable changes that will ensure that future generations will not have to experience what we have experienced. Changes such as mandating that all faculty and staff receive diversity training in order to maintain employment. Ensuring that the ethnicity of the faculty and staff properly reflect the diversity of the student body. Providing classes that are taught from a perspective other than the perspective of Eurocentric values. And stop allowing professors and worship leaders to demonize our style of worship. You have one week. One week to speak to our often dismissed concerns. One week to reverse the narrative that the concerns of our counterparts are valued more than our own. One week to honor those who have survived ill treatment. One week to acknowledge the jaded, 
racial history of this institution. One week to draft a manifesto that will ensure our equal treatment for years to come. One week to say, I'm sorry. We should have done better. We will do better. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. You have one week. So a lot of intentionality went into the production of that video, as I mentioned earlier, and as I was watching it again, remembering that even the song that we chose as the bed, the score underneath, the lyrics to that song is, say something, I'm giving up on you. Those are the lyrics to the song. Choosing a song that is literally about, you need to take action because we're going to give up. And that's what's the underscore to what we were trying to do. So immediately, we uploaded on February 18th, um, around 4 p.m. Um, I remember I had things to do immediately after, so I wasn't on social media for a couple of hours, but when I got back onto my Facebook page, it had already gone to about, uh, several hours later, it was already at like 5,000, 6,000 views, um, already dozens and dozens of comments. I think we, for the first 24 hours of the video being out, it was getting about 2,500 to 3,000 views an hour. So for the first 24 hours. So it was just growing and growing and growing, shares upon shares upon shares. And those initial reactions from the group, the, those of us, the It Is Time Nine, those of us in the video, our initial reaction was kind of this excitement, like, oh, this is, this is going. This is going fast. <laughs> And then we're looking at the comments, and it is certainly a mixed bag. Um, I think initially, uh, there was very little nuance as a response to our protest. It was either you hated it or you loved it. And as time grew, grew, went on and, and things kind of became more people were becoming a little bit more nuanced in their response to it, but it, that initial response was just one or the other. It was fairly polarized. Um, we had comments from people even within our Andrews community, not just students, but some faculty and staff who were seeking to undermine the protest immediately. People who were pointing to other events where uh, Andrews had made statements here and there, but nothing, as we mentioned in the video, public and decisive as which we were asking for. So now I wanna kind of transition into talking a little bit about what you as a leader uh, might be able to bring to the table, what, what as an activist, what I needed from our leader in Polite. Okay, so these are things that you can use as the things that you need to bring to the table as you are going back and mobilizing your millennial activists. Uh, the first thing that was extremely necessary for our leader to bring to the conversation, to bring to the table, was focus. Focus was very, very important as all of the comments are coming in. I remember, I think I got a text message from everyone who has my number. Right? So, and, and I know I, I wasn't the only one. Everyone on the team was, was experiencing that as people are asking questions on social media that you're wanting to respond to. What was most important from our leader was having someone who could help us stay focused. There was a specific goal that we were trying to accomplish and we needed someone to corral all of the energy that was coming our way and that we were exerting just to focus it. The second thing is frequency. Uh, Polite, uh, we had a group chat. There was, he was constantly in contact with us as a team. We met often, uh, multiple times in a day throughout that week, uh, just constantly meeting, constantly in contact. As a leader, you will have to be frequently in contact with your activists not only to keep them motivated and to keep them focused, uh, but to make sure that they are doing okay. And, and the last thing, which I think is perhaps most important, is forecasting. Uh, he leveraged his experience with things like this beforehand, uh, with his age, his, his, his maturity, um, and his connection to the Holy Spirit to be able to forecast exactly what was going to be coming our way 
being able to look out and say, okay, they will probably respond this way, and you're probably going to get this thing coming your way. And doing that allowed us to orient ourselves properly so that we could kind of tread the course with just a little bit more insight than what we had. For many of us, this was one of our initial, this was one of our first times kind of stepping out, um, stepping out as, as, as activists. So that's something that we needed. We, we didn't know exactly what would come our way, but our leader had forecasted much of that for us. Um, now, it's not just that the activists are requiring things of the leader. As leaders, you will require things of your activists as well. It's not just that you are um, the one in the hot seat. You have the right, as a leader, to require certain things of your activists. And the things that were required of us as activists were these things. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch. I don't. The things that were required of us were these three, three, three things. Commitment, um, polite, our leader was requiring that we be committed to this cause. That it's not just that we're going to be in the video, that we're going to get our face in this thing, upload it, and then wash our hands and we're out. We had to be committed to this cause all the way to the end. So there's this conversation at the very beginning of us setting out on this, where we're looking around the room saying, uh, this could... This could go places that I'm not sure we're all really, we don't know where this could go. Are you committed no matter what? That's a legitimate question that you should be asking as a leader as you are mobilizing your millennial activists. The second thing was camaraderie. Uh, we had to support each other in a very real sense. We had to be the support system for each other because people are fickle. And those who are supporting you online might not support you in person, or those who are dapping you up and sending you text messages like, hey, I'm glad you're doing this, I support this, will not leverage their voice to support you in the public setting. So there is a nece it was necessary for there to be camaraderie amongst the team as we are encouraging each other, being a support system for each other. And the last thing, which I think is most important, was courage. So at the end of the day, being an activist, especially when you are coming against uh, the age-old traditions of white supremacy, being an activist requires that you have courage, especially when you're coming against a system, an institution, you're asking it to change, and you are frankly embarrassing that institution. There needs to be courage involved in all of that. So those were the things. Um, immediately following, there was significant backlash um, I received hundreds of personal messages because it was on my Facebook page. Hundreds of people messaged me, both in support and otherwise. There were articles being written about it. Um, Spectrum put up an article, and in the comments, people were being just blatantly racist. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous, even on the actual video itself. It was amazing how much blatant racism. I remember one particular comment was saying that if you actually wanted to have equality, why didn't you just go to Oakwood? which would seem to suggest that if you aren't at an HBCU, you don't deserve equality. It was insane. All kinds of backlash coming our way throughout the process. Um, and so, the, so those are the, in the days immediately following afterwards. Um, significant, uh, some, some loss of, of relationships on campus. There was a stress on campus and, and this, this thought process going on on campus that was palpable that you could feel. So there's this tension that truly exists there on campus. So as you have heard the perspective of an activist being led by their pastor at their church, I'm hoping you're starting to conceptualize your own methodology for galvanizing activists in your community. This is essential for your church growth. This is essential for having evangelistic relevance. And it is essential for you exhibiting the character of Christ. For Christ is not just the lamb that was slain. That's what Constantine would have you walk away from the gospel and only believe that he is the lamb that was slain, which puts you in a position to always be there to get slain. And Constantine would love that type of people. I mean, that's, that's what the Romans were really wanting everybody to feel like. If you come against me, you will be slain. But in that same chapter in the book of Revelation, 
He's not just called the lamb that was slain. He's also called the lion of the tribe of Judah. So what we see is that the gospel inherently allows lion and lamb to coexist. And that is a prophecy from one of the great prophets, as you know, that this is a land where lion and lamb will lay together. That is not just talking about the civility of heaven. It's actually talking about the character of God, that God, within God, both lion and lamb temperaments coexist without contradicting one another. Therefore, every local church must have lion and lamb aspects. So when we talk about how to mobilize, you are saying to yourself, we are like Christ as we move forward in lamb-like methods, but you are equally like Christ when you move forward with lion-like methods. So when you are trying to mobilize as a spiritual guide in your sphere of influence, we want to make sure that you're catching what this looks like. Mobilizing looks like, first, you as the leader must validate the cause of the activist. That is your job. You must validate the cause. Second, you must have authentic involvement from the leader. You wouldn't believe how many people reached out to me and said, well, you know, Polite, I love the fact that you support the students, et cetera, but you know you could have done that without being on the video. True. The issue with that is I would not have influence capital with the students to where they would trust me and follow the guidance I was giving. They'd be like, no, we're, we're the one out here taking these shots. You not. You in your office calling us from time to time, seeing if we okay. No, you have to have authentic involvement. It is not enough for you to sit in your pastoral study sending out instructions to your activists who are in the streets you need to be in the streets with them. Amen. Then you need to be setting ethical standards. That's that, eth that's that etiquette thing. We have to find ethical high ground in our protests because that's what solidifies the confidence that God is with us. If you are shaky on whether or not what you're doing is ethical, your faith will also be shaken when you have the backlash roll in telling you that you are of Lucifer and not of your Father in heaven. Number four, incarnational leadership. Uh, many people, uh, this was covered by the University of Missouri and used as a case study in their PhD program for higher education administration. And one thing the students gave as feedback is they could not tell who the associate chaplain was. They couldn't tell who the pastor was. And they all guessed wrong. No one chose me as they were asking this Q&A in the class. And it is because as a minister, you have a responsibility to be incarnational. Christ is successful because he looks like a human. That's a key component of his success. If he came as a spirit, I don't believe he would have been as successful communicating the Father's love to humans. So as, as your activists come knocking on the door, you probably will have to lose that suit and tie. You know, you probably may, might have to put on some Chuck Taylors and a cap backwards, you know. You may have to put on straight out of and the city that you are currently pastoring in. But that's okay. It's incarnational. And I assure you, it will help you with your influence. Finally, you have to have courageous resolve. Courageous resolve. You have to be willing to put it on the line. People ask me, was I ignorant to the fact that I could have been fired? No, I wasn't ignorant to it. As a matter of fact, my mother called me the night of and said, well, son, your daddy said he'll try to get you a job down here if you need one. <laughs> I said, well, thank you, mom, but I'm praying that we can hang in here and survive this and stand to fight on another day. You gotta have courageous resolve. And, and maybe that's one of the pay dirt moments for any spiritual guide of an activist. Are you willing to die for it? Do you really believe in Martin Luther King Jr.'s counsel where he says you have not lived until you found something to die for? Will your activist see within you a reckless willingness to sacrifice yourself on behalf of others? For that, my friends, is the true manifestation of the love of Christ in you. This is what the Holy Spirit 
allowed for us to accomplish by following these mobilizing points. Now, I don't believe our university followed these points the first time they responded to an activist. But I do believe that they got it right on their second try. And so at this time, I want you to turn your attention to the screen for the university's response to the It Is Time AU campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As Andrews University, we want to thank you. While it is always difficult to listen to stories that document pain, injustice, and mistreatment within our community, we are thankful that you have spoken directly, honestly, and from your heart. We want you to know that we have heard your legitimate concerns about systemic racism and injustice for the African American community that has marked centuries of this country's history. Most importantly, we want you to know that we have heard your heartfelt and painful reflections. These stories speak to a reality that has been a disgraceful part of the history of this institution and our church for the last 14 decades. The tragic realities of racism and injustice injure the lives, hearts, and souls of our community right here at Andrews University and in the larger communities we belong to. You've asked for a response within a week. We'd agree. In fact, it should not take us any time at all to answer and acknowledge some essential things. So let's begin right now. I'm sorry. I am sorry. I'm sorry. I am sorry. As an organization, we have been guilty of racial bias, of making our faculty, staff, and students of color feel less than. We have not listened well enough. We have not been sensitive enough. And we have missed opportunities to take action where action should have been taken. For that, I apologize. I am sorry. Andrews University's history has been marked by systemic racism. In the past, official policies have included forced segregation in the cafeteria and prohibitions against interracial dating. For that, I apologize. I am sorry. Explicit racist acts committed against black students have been part of our history, including cross burnings on our campus in 1969 and 1974. Hateful words and actions have been directed against our students. Even today, our minority students have been misunderstood and marginalized. For that, I apologize. So I believe the only answer is a simple but profoundly challenging one. We must do better. And be better. We must do better. And be better. We must do better and be better. To begin, this progress will be achieved by direct, frequent, and meaningful interactions about the changes we need. In the classroom, from the pulpit, in meeting rooms and offices, and even around cafeteria tables. It's a change that will involve listening to the voices of those who continue to be treated unjustly, including those from other marginalized and minority groups. This change will involve each of us, including those who may not understand the pain and difficulties that some within our community face. In addition to civil and productive dialogue, here are some specific steps we're implementing on a campus already blessed with a remarkable richness of diversity. We must explore and pursue the strength diversity brings if we are to center our community in God's calling for our lives. The first step is this. We will immediately begin a search for a full-time senior level administrator of diversity, a new cabinet level position that reports directly to me and will drive meaningful, visible and ongoing change. This position will expand and strengthen cultural diversity training that will be required of all faculty, staff, and students. As a campus, we will continue to diversify our faculty, staff, and administration in order to assure high quality education that prepares our students to serve meaningfully in a global environment. Our curriculum should also clearly reflect and educate our students about our diversity. 
we will have a strengthened grievance process that allows students to simply and directly report injustice and mistreatment of all kinds and to seek resolution. We will commit to honor and celebrate all the ways we seek and achieve community, including how we gather and worship together throughout our university family. We will also seek to understand, celebrate, and honor the ways we worship from within the classroom and beyond as we reflect that commitment and understanding as teachers, staff, and community. I pledge to hold Andrews University accountable. I pledge to hold Andrews University accountable to be a place of commitment, a place of real change, a place where God's influence is evident and reflects the call of Jesus Christ to be a loving community. I pledge to hold Andrews University accountable to learn from the painful lessons of the past and commit to a more just, caring, and inclusive future. We pledge to hold Andrews University accountable to pursue these goals in transparent, measurable, and significant ways. We pledge to hold Andrews University accountable to pursue these goals in transparent, measurable, and significant ways. I pledge to guide and inspire Andrews University to become a visible example of racial justice and equality. Our campus will be a place of safety for our African American students and employees, as well as for people of all races, ethnicities, and cultures. This ongoing journey towards reconciliation, healing, and transformation will be hallmarks of this university. May God bless this process of reconciliation, healing, and transformation. May God bless this process of reconciliation, healing, and transformation for our students and campus community. So may God bless this process of reconciliation, healing, and transformation for our entire community, both on this campus and beyond. A process that continues today and culminates in the joyous return of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a powerful moment when that video was played. And my mother, the same mother who feared for my life five days earlier, called me on that day and said that she broke down crying while she was washing dishes and watching because she had never seen an Adventist institution validate the cause of black members in that way. And so as we look back at these mobilizing points, I want you to now look and see if you can see these elements in Andrews' response. First, did they validate the cause? They sure did. Did they have authentic involvement from our key leaders? They did. Did they set ethical standards moving forward? Yes, they did. Did they have incarnational leadership? Were they on the front lines with other students in that video? They were. And did our president show courageous resolve? as well as our provost and VPs. And as I'm looking at how this panned out, the first time they sought to reject and quell. The second time they looked to direct and swell. And remember, when you reject and quell, you end up marginalizing. But when you direct and swell, you end up discipling. So to see if they are successful, we would have to be able to quantify whether or not our administration has gained disciples by successfully mobilizing activism. I want to introduce you to Ben Lee. You might remember his face because he was one of the It Is Time Nine. And he's rocking a t-shirt that has been spreading across our campus for the last year. We will be okay with a mountain range and the name Dr. Luxton at the bottom. Because when she gave her speech on that Thursday, which I believe was one of the most powerful speeches I've ever heard in American history, what an example of spiritual leadership that is being guided by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just powerful. She then says, and we have, quoting Nelson Mandela, and we have other mountains to climb but we will be okay. 
Students grabbed that, that phrase and made an entire campaign of support for Dr. Luxton. T-shirts were going everywhere. You could still come to our campus today and see students walking around and the We Will Be OK t-shirts. She was able to gain the influence capital to disciple future activists. And those activists didn't come against her, but instead they championed her cause and helped to propel her leadership forward on our campus. To where if I had to suggest who the most beloved leader at Andrews University is today, it is Dr. Andrea Luxton, by far. And I believe it is because she followed these key points on mobilizing activists. Our church desperately needs churches, congregations who are actively involved in activism. We need that. And there are plenty of reasons why being engaged in activism is important and beneficial to the body of Christ. Most notably, there is an opportunity for discipleship to be found in activism. Uh, the, the millennial spirit has this desire for activism in it because we can't unsee all of the things that the internet is showing us. Now more than ever, we can see the things and the pain that's happening in Myanmar and around the world and, and, and the people getting shot here in America. We, we see Philando Castile and Alton Sterling and Eric Gardner. We see these videos and it's situated deep inside of our hearts in a way that it can never be removed. So we are naturally called just by the times to be activists. But then we go to churches that do not direct that. That, that, that don't cultivate that. So there is a need for a place that leverages the power of the gospel for activism in a powerful way. And I, <clears throat> I think the most important thing that can come from that is an opportunity for evangelism. There's a major opportunity to leverage activism for evangelism. Imagine if you could go out into the community and rally up all of the activists who are already there I mean, truly, there are people in the community surrounding our churches who are living out the gospel by way of activism already. If the Bible says that bearing, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, there are people who are out there fulfilling the law of Christ better than the church already. So imagine if you were able to rally those people together and introduce them to a Jesus who cares about the issues of this world. That is a powerful evangelistic tool. I think that is the greatest case for why our churches should be involved in social justice and in activism. So how do you know if you are an activist friendly spiritual guide? How do you know that as you're making your own inventory of your leadership and if an activist could find haven and platform at your local church? Well, I think it's easy. Are you one who is willing to challenge oppressive members in your church? Or are you still letting that, those same elders and deacons and deaconess and board members terrorize church members who really want to serve the Lord with gladness? Are you willing to challenge oppressive denominational practices like the distribution of resources to the local church? or the ordination of women into the gospel ministry? Are you willing to challenge oppressive societal norms? Can a police chief terrorize your community and your church not say anything about it? Or will they be held accountable by you primarily as a spiritual guide and your members as your mobilized activists? Are you willing to challenge oppressive governments? Do you have in your sermonic calendar a season where you educate your members on their civil responsibilities to hold their civic leaders accountable and to become a part of the process that seats people and can also unseat them as well? And will you challenge oppressive demonic forces 
For Paul says, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but there are some spiritual forces of darkness in high places. He goes on to say in the book of Corinthians that our weapons are not carnal, but are spiritual for the pulling down of strongholds. Is that a message that is being perpetuated from your pulpit, from your meetings, from your interactions with your members? We must become activist friendly churches led by activist friendly leaders and here's why because your harvest is great i look at garrison here he is an activist that i have been able to empower and he is about to move on and join the cpc community praise center church in alexandria virginia partnering with Dr. Bron Jacobs. That's where he's headed next, and he will be an activist there. Amen. Pastor Tatum Fowler, who's sitting right over there, she is an activist from the Central States Conference. She will be heading back there when she leaves Andrews. I've been able to empower her as well. Dr. Tom, excuse, Pastor Tanya Loveday, soon to be Dr. Loveday. Amen. We received that. <laughs> She will go to her sphere of influence. Pastor Amanda Hawley, I was able to work with her. And she will go to her influence. Pastor B.C. Nwade, who's right here, she, he will go to his sphere of influence. Pastor Daniel Barnard, who's right here, she will go to her sphere of influence. Listen, I have had the privilege of walking beside these millennial activists, and I know they are going to bear much fruit in due season if they faint not. And that's the joy that you will have when you embrace the ministry of activism. I want to thank you for the time. You can read more about the It Is Time AU campaign in the Journal of Negro Education, just released not too many weeks ago. The Journal of Negro Education comes out of Howard University, and they have chronicled the It Is Time campaign there. Dr. Sidney Freeman, who's here, I want to thank you for being a part of that contributing um, 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 body with Dr. Ty Douglas, as well as Pastor Evan Willis, who worked in conjunction. These are Adventist scholars pushing forward what is happening on the, on the front lines of the Advent movement, as well as Ev Milner, if you are looking to buy one of these shirts and to push back against the use of white Jesus as a colonial icon in your church or in your schools, I do believe that she would love, she would love to have you join her movement, pushing back against colonialism and how it has infected the Advent movement. And so at this time, we want to open up the floor uh, for a Q&A. And so if you do have a question, please come to the mic. We would love to answer any questions that you have that are germane to being an activist leader or uh, f facilitating an activist-friendly space at your local church. We just ask that when you come to the mic, you do formulate your questions in the form of the interrogative and not the declarative as well as make sure that it is as concise as possible so that we can facilitate as many answers as possible in our final moments. Enjoyed the presentation. Um, sometimes in my community, I run into the black activists um, and they talk about you know, Afrocentric approach. And one of my challenges to them is that your God and your cause is too small. That the God that you believe in is only the God of black people. How do we make sure that the activism um, encompasses all of the breadth of the gospel and its inclusiveness of the entire world while also uplifting those who have been marginalized in our communities? Excellent question. I think the first step in that journey is you have to prove that Yahweh is a God that supports black people first. That's how you win those activists. I mean, I sit down with activists all the time, five percenters, uh, for example, and or from the Nation of Islam. Let's go with Nation of Islam. I think I have a better direct correlation there. Uh, I've sat down with brothers there, and I've let them know, for example, that the Hebrews were black people. Now, when they hear a Christian pastor say that, their ears perk. They say, well, well, well what do you mean there, Reverend? I said, well, Abraham was a black man. Some of y'all didn't know that, right? But it's right there in your Bible. The Bible says that Ham had Cush, right? 
Cush had Nimrod. Nimrod is the first great champion. By the way, the first great champion of our world was a black man. Nimrod goes and settles these nine cities. One of those cities is the city of Ur. Guess where Abraham came from? Now, some people have been colonized to think that that is more of like Persia. That is not true. It's not true. Back in that time, if you read other texts outside of the Bible and other commentaries outside of the colonial commentaries we are given at the seminary, you will see that that territory was considered Africa as well during the time of Abraham. Yeah, but we're not taught that in schools because we're given Constantine's gospel. And so when I start sitting down with these advocates, these activists out in my community who believe that Christianity is just this bastardized story that is now taking from the community and not giving to the community, that the white Jesus is being used to incarcerate the minds of black people, not liberate the minds of black people. When I sit down and start telling them about the Yahweh that I know, it changes things. And now I've created inroads to win over not only their influence, but their ideas as well, which will help mobilize activists in my own local church. Yeah, we'll go to this mic and then we'll head over. Um, have, have any of these movements or videos been publicized and supported by the NAD? Interesting question. Do you know that the NAD has this sit down, let's chat? No, yeah, I was, that's what I came here for on on this past December 2nd. Yeah, yeah. Is this yes. thing on? Is this thing on? Yeah. yeah, is this thing on? Thank you. Is this thing on? The first one was at Union College. Right. And I was so thankful that the curator of the questions took that question first mm -hmm. and asked Dan Jackson as well as Alex Bryant what their view is about the It Is Time AU movement. And man, Elder Jackson was very transparent that at first he was taken aback by it and was not supportive of the movement. But after hearing Dr. Andrea Luxton's response, he felt convicted that she had the right path for engaging activists. And he supported this conversation that it has started. And he also lended his support as well as Elder Bryant uh, to, to the continuing efforts that have been sparked by Andrews to remedy the discrimination and the racial disparities that are still apparent in the world church. Follow up. Do you see that like branching out? Do you see effects of that today, like branching out in that support? Do you see? Oh man, started? yes. I would see. I met a woman um, in Portland, Tennessee, who actually said that the church played our video and the response video back to back at their local level, awesome. fell under conviction, and that church drafted a manifesto apologizing. This is in the Kentucky 10 Conference, apologizing for the ills that it has perpetuated, asking the black members who have left because they were marginalized to come back to hear their apology, and even being willing to reorganize the board to where demographics are always represented on the board. So it's having local level impact as well. See, that needs to be a video on the front page of the NAD website right there, so. Oh, thank, thank you so for much. that affirmation. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, wanted to ask a question. Um, because of the Eurocentric aspect of our denomination, and though we're a black section or a ethnic section underneath that, uh, one thing that I'm finding is that there has been so much, uh, not only just self-hate, but um, uh, defeated mentality amongst our own youth uh, because of that, uh, whether they're from you know different countries or even this one itself, uh, that what they're doing will not either be heard or it won't go that far. And then the other issue is the ones with the radical uh, fervor to do so uh, usually have the tendency to be outside of our congregation. And one of the issues then that we have is um, they would love to join or love to be a part of, but then somehow or another you have to, I don't wanna say tame, uh, but also kind of you know bridle the situation that is geared in the right direction, being represented by you as a vehicle. So how do you suggest to manage that? Excellent. I actually believe that Garrison is positioned perfectly to take on this question, so I'm gonna pass it over to him, and we'll end out with those who are standing at the mics. These will be our final questions moving forward. 
I think that what the movement, what the It Is Time AU movement did for me is that it placed this example of a time where activism worked, where even though there's a natural pessimism that I have towards anything changing at all, seeing that something worked was encouraging. So what I've done for those who are in my sphere of influence, who are feeling the same things that you're feeling, like, yo, I wanna see change, but I don't really know how to go about it, is I share what we've shared here with them as, and I share the video and the articles written about the video as encouragement, just to say that God is working through this means and through this method. He's doing things through this. And he's, in, he's asking us and inviting us to have faith in him that he can actually change the hearts of men. I think that that's something that, that as leaders, like we have to have that hope that God is leading us to, to, to do these things for the purpose of him showing his name and showing his power great. So I think that there's hope to be found in what we were able to accomplish, what God did through our movement, and I hope that that can extend to be hope for other activists coming up. The ones... I think that the, the, the idea of etiquette that was expressed, that this is the way that we're going about doing things here is also very, very important. I mean, within your context, you can have your methodology and you can invite people to buy in to what you're doing, right? Yeah, great question. Thank you very much for, for the presentation. Um, every successful movement needs scholars, needs thinkers. Um, I especially like what you did in terms of taking the, the prophetic construct with Constantine that we already have and kind of expanding it to include some of these other things. Do you know whether or not there are, or, or whether perhaps you would be willing to consider having more scholarship done on that. The reason I'm saying this is that many people at the local level may not be able to have the time or the ability to put that together. And what we have done successfully as Adventists is have our thinkers create resources which we can then take and present in our local contexts. So having, for example, a prophetic uh, presentation, a revelation seminar that is actually based on this wing of prophecy, really speaking to the issues that are happening in our current situation, whereas perhaps the Sunday law is not as relevant to people on the ground as it used to be, maybe something that would be very helpful for, for us. I'm just wondering whether or not there's a resource that you may consider producing. I completely agree with you. If I just, wanna, I just wanna kinda jump in just quickly. I think that our Adventist theology is actually perfectly positioned for the liberation conversation rather than the judgment conversation. Much of what we talk about much of what we talk about from our Adventists, our five S's or our Adventist staples, they come from a perspective of judgment. Judgment is always brought upon the oppressor, but the oppressed always find liberation, right? So if we took our Adventist theology and looked at it through the lens of liberation, I think that we would actually have the scholarship necessary to empower people to, to free them from the chains that they have naturally. So I completely agree with you in that there needs to be bursary, money, um, investment set aside for our Adventist scholars, specifically black Adventist scholars, to get PhDs and THDs in this field so that we can be, get, begin to shift the way that we look at the word of God and look at our Adventist theology. Um, so my question has more to do with um, the aftershock, I guess, of these conversations. I find that in a lot of my dialogue with students that I'm friends with um, that hold opposite views of me, um, you, you talked about losing a lot of friends. What, what's your work of reconciliation look like um, with people on the other side? Since we're all children of God, it's not like we divorce any one child, you know what I mean? Like they're in our body forever. So what does the work of reconciliation look like for you guys? I want to reference the story of Joseph as the perfect model for reconciliation. And I think it's healthy reconciliation. I want to underline the word healthy because currently I do think this colonized gospel that we've been taught actually pushes us to unhealthy reconciliation processes. Healthy reconciliation, according to Joseph, is, an, is a time of facilitating of a time of testing. Okay, so reconciliation is a two-step process. There must be repentance, then forgiveness. Sometimes reconciliation is posited as a one-step process, synonymous with forgiveness, but that is flawed. 
the logic there breaks because it is not just the forgiveness of God that brings us into a reconcil reconciled state with the Father. It's also the repentant spirit that aligns with the forgiveness of God, which creates reconciliation. So as I look at Joseph, he's entering into this time of testing, which I do want to also posit parenthetically that if you really want to understand the investigative judgment, you need to read and study Joseph's dealing with his brothers, okay? But that is a different presentation for a different time. <laughs> Joseph tests whether or not, first, the brothers are willing to give up their privilege, okay? That's why he gives more food to Benjamin than anyone else. He wants to know if they're willing to give up privilege. The second thing he tests is whether or not they are willing to put themselves on the line for someone who's being oppressed, okay? That's why he puts the cup in Benjamin's bag. And then when he threatens to keep Benjamin incarcerated for the rest of his life, guess what his brothers do? Judah namely stands up and says, no, take me and my sons, but don't take him. It is only after that that Joseph reveals himself and says, hey, it's I, I'm your brother. You cannot say that you are the brother or sister of someone else until this reconciliation has taken place. And that takes place when you see that they're willing to give up their privilege and you verify that they're willing to sacrifice themselves on behalf of the oppressed. If an individual cannot be reconciled based on those two tenets, I actually am not interested in being a friend with them. Question, um, I was looking to see if you had any tips in regards to engaging white leadership within the Adventist church and conversations and movements such as this. I am not at an institution, um, but I'm uh, running something very similar with ASJ. Uh, and one of the frustrations that I get a lot from activist millennials and so forth that are passionate and ready to move is the silence of uh, white pastors, white leadership. Um, and I know at an institution, the president and the VPs and so forth, there was a, div a diverse response, but outside of those walls, especially as we are trying to get churches and pastors to do this work, do you have any tips on how we can engage that side of it? And that's a rough terrain to traverse, but I will say that I have seen God do amazing things. Uh, first and foremost, we'll use Pastor Dwight Nelson, Dr. Dwight Nelson as case in point. Um, there have been certain sermons that he preached that he now publicly says, you know, I have a different ideology now. You know, from what I know now, I would have never preached that in that way. You have to go on PMC's website and watch his sermon on white privilege. It is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And it is a privileged individual speaking to the fact that we need to relinquish this privilege. It's powerful um, and it's redemptive. That sermon was the result of a black doctor who continued to have dialogue with Dwight Nelson, giving him resources to read, okay? Now, where I want to pause here is some people will not hear you. And that is because fragility is cemented by privilege. So the fragileness that privilege creates cannot withstand the pressure of change, right, right. okay? So some people, that fragility is just too much. They can't overcome it. And so you have to count your losses and move on. But there are advocates. There are individuals that as we work with them and we open up this dialogue with them and we are persistent, okay? Not combative necessarily, but persistent in providing them resources to read. They may not receive it from me, but they might receive it from this person that that over time can yield a beautiful transformation. This doctor had been working with Dwight on this topic for at least eight years. At least eight years. So as we move into this idea of inviting our white brothers and sisters, and really brothers and sisters of any other ethnic group of privilege, people who cannot identify with the suffrage and the struggle, as we go to win allies among them, we have to be persistent. We have to understand that there's a fragility there that might not withstand the pressure of our advocacy and our activism. And then we have to ask God to lead us to those who will turn and become allies in the fight. Thank you.
Final question. Uh, I must honor you guys on the great step and uh, the chap in myself and the female. I am proud on both sides. It made me feel proud. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Thank you for that. My question is, I understand that most of the, what I heard is that many of the activists right now is planning on moving out. If there's something set in place that this movement continues, when, well, the chaplain, you may be there, but the other students who are moving on, is there something in place for this continue? Because sometimes things happen, but when things happen, we drop arms, and then it's not done. So I want to know, is there something in place that you guys have that this process continues? Yeah, I think that's a beautiful question, and you're, exa you're exactly right. Um, as people transition out, the passion could just dissipate. Uh, the university followed through with their commitment, and they actually hired a vice president of diversity and inclusion. They added that position to their cabinet. His name is uh, Dr. Michael Nixon, and he has been doing a phenomenal job. And the legacy is that he is leaving will continue on. The fact that his position is there is that thing that kind of helps me feel like, okay, even after we leave, there's someone who is committed to diversity and inclusion. That's their job, and they have the power of a vice president. Mike um, and Garrison, first of all, today was amazing, and I'm learning so much. Um, what I'm about to ask might be embarrassing for some, but not for me. I feel very far behind in this conversation. I think added to it is that little twist that I grew up in the Caribbean, where 95% of people around me were black. So I just came to this country with that, that bias. And sometimes I don't see, I don't respond. I realize that from Freddie Haynes. What do you say to those of us who hear you present, and it makes sense in this moment, but unless it continues to be put in that way, we just don't naturally see where we fit or even understand how to catch up to a conversation that's 300 years old, mm -hmm. right? Um, and where would you point us for an elementary school experience so that we can join the conversation because I I feel it when you speak but what you're speaking about is as natural for you as music is for me mm -hmm. and I need I need schooling because I know that I want to understand but understanding it on my own is not natural excellent question friend excellent question I'll try to answer it concisely by giving two ways that I think uh, social justice passion is picked up by an individual who has interest. The first is through osmosis. Let me tell you, some of the best social justice training that I received when it comes to activists came from a barbershop off of Jefferson Street in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, Jefferson Street is the hub and bedrock for civil rights activism during the civil rights movement. I mean, it is similar to what the Harlem Renaissance did in the North, Jefferson Street did for the South. And I'm in that barbershop, and this is what they're talking about every week. And I make sure I go there every week, and I block out time to where I'm not just there for the cut, and then I leave. Now, I know you and I both don't have much to cut, but brother, you could get that line up on that beard or something. Anything to get you in the door and give you that entryway to finding this community where you could just kind of pick up on the vibes and the conversation and the learning that's being shared through dialogue. I know in every, definitely cities, I know it's harder to um, find this in rural areas. So I do concede that point for those who are saying, well, I don't even know if that community exists near me. Uh, but being intentional about putting yourself in an environment where this conversation is happening 
with people who are passionate about it already can really uh, boost or expedite your evolution in the content. Also, mentorship is the, is the second one. I have had strategic mentors along the way who are saying, read this. I didn't read Faces at the Bottom of the Well by Derek Bell until someone said, read this. I didn't read The Souls of Black, Fol Black Folks by Du Bois until somebody said, read this. I didn't read The Miseducation of a Negro by Carter G. Woodson until someone said, read this. There are so many things out there that can help us educate ourselves. We just don't know where to start in many cases, and we'll be overwhelmed by the list on Google. Mentorship helps you target your reading and your learning. I want to thank you all once again for being here with us, for mobilizing millennial activists. It's an honor that you would choose to spend your time here this morning with us in this way. Before we dismiss, I want to give a final two shout out to um, two activists that I just have a love for who are here in the audience today. Uh, one is Pastor Anthony Bolden, who's a pastor right here at Oakwood University Church. Uh, he has this awesome vision for taking his gifts into the public school system and revamping the public school system by attaining a position of leadership there. That is activism at its highest and at its best. I just wanna affirm that vision. And then Pastor Warren Gillum, who was a part of the It Is Time Nine. You saw him on the video, he's here today. I wanna to give a shout out to him because he is coming to us from England. And a lot of individuals sometimes come to America from their context and have a hard time identifying with this race war here on our shores. But what Warren is walking in is what Marcus Garvey said. When Marcus Garvey comes from Jamaica to America and says, understand this, that the black man is oppressed around the world. What powerful words from Marcus Garvey. So I wanna thank Pastor Warren Gillum for being a part of the movement and saying, no, this is my fight too, for I am black, I am on planet Earth, therefore I have something to advocate for. Thank you once again for your time. All right, yeah, let's put our hands together for Pastor Polite and Pastor Hayes. What an amazing job, thank you. Um, uh, they're going to hang around for a few moments so you can engage them down front here. Uh, just a few announcements. First of all, we want to uh, remind you that the next wave of, of seminars start at 3. Worship will be in the Mosley at 5 with Pastor.